Okay. I think we get started. Um, Perfect. Great. So thanks everyone um, for joining. So today we're going to be talking about um, practices for safe sex. So um, specifically, I think we're going to dive in on some of the ways that people have made centralized exchanges or proposed to make centralized exchanges uh, safer from um, uh, for misappropriation and fraud, and also some of the ways that decentralized exchanges have been designed to, to tackle some of these same problems and some of the trade-offs between those. Um, bef before we get started, uh, maybe if we want to go around uh, and introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm, I'm Dan, I'm uh, head of research at Paradigm, um, although here I'm, I'm speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the firm. Um, and uh, in my work, I've done a good amount with decentralized exchange, including helping Uniswap with V2 and V3 of their uh, decentralized exchange protocol. Um, Vitalik, uh, Nick, and Jesse, do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. Uh, so I'm the uh, founder of the, of the Ethereum protocol and uh, original lead writer of Bitcoin, I suppose. Um, I've uh, also been uh, interested in this uh, exchange proof of solvency topic for, for a long time. Um, and in the uh, wake of the FTX collapse a few weeks ago, I wrote that article that was uh, basically just outlining a bunch of uh, d different approaches that exchange could take to improve their auditability and their and decrease their ability to misappropriate funds with uh, various levels of trade-offs. So happy to talk about all of that with everyone here today. Hi guys, um, I'm Nick. Um, General partner of Castle Island Ventures. I am a uh, proof of reserve uh, slash liability enthusiast. Um, I maintain a, uh, a bit of a database, I guess, of uh, various attempts at proof of reserve on my website um, and uh, just doing my best to push forward best practices among exchanges and, and pretty encouraged by what I've seen lately. So excited about the proof of reserve sector these days. I'm Jesse Powell, co-founder and CEO of Kraken. Uh, we did the first proof of reserves back in 2014, and I've done two in the past year and got another one coming up uh, in January as well. And uh, also excited to see some more people uh, getting interested in this now. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation out there, I think, about what proof of reserves actually is. Uh, so looking forward to discussing this today. Cool. And then Ellie and Hong, do you want to introduce yourselves? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, this is Hong Feng. Um, I am a CEO of OKX and a CEO of OKCoin. We have been around for quite a long time. Um, OKCoin actually did uh, its uh, proof of reserve in back in 2014. Uh, OKX completed our first Merkle proof of reserve on November 22nd this year. Um, we are a, a strong believer in providing more transparency and autonomy um, and ownership to um, to our customers and and a strong believer in uh, decentralization as well. I'm happy to talk about our efforts on on this as well as um, our efforts with uh, DEX and um, related um, non custodial uh, solutions. Uh, Eli Ben Sasson, co founder and president of Starkware. Um, previously a researcher on uh, ZK Snarks and ZK Starks, also co-inventor of ZK Starks, um, also one of the founding scientists of Zcash. Um, proof of reserves are very, very dear to my heart because uh, basically the moment or the day I took the red pill and entered blockchain was when I gave a talk in 2013 in the Bitcoin San Jose conference. Um, and basically one of the examples there was a proof of uh, assets um, that I basically described how to use uh, ZK proofs to show that. Um, and today at Starkware, we're very uh, much in favor of uh, prevention rather than detection. Um, and as I'll explain, the StarkX system actually prevents uh, some of the things that proof of reserve systems help detect. Great. So... Maybe to set up just to frame the discussion, does someone want to um, describe why we're talking about this now? Maybe for an alien who just arrived on Earth. Um, it seems like proof of reserves has been a major topic of discussion in the past month more than any other time. Um, Vitalik, you would, you would oppose to that, uh, 
that I think that it helps propel this uh, back into the conversation. Do you want to talk about why we're talking about this? Yeah. Uh, so about a month ago, as uh, people fully know, um, the FTX, one of the biggest exchanges in the in the uh, space, uh, collapsed and was found to probably or not have enough money to co- to cover most of its uh, depositors and it was discovered that there was just like huge amounts of accounting malfeasance uh, going on like there were uh, some uh, Alameda basically had the um had a uh, de facto unlimited credit line from FTX and that ended up being used as a way to uh, siphon deposits away and a whole bunch of other things happened and it's just an example of a problem where there is an actual problem in the crypto space and there is a yeah, potential regulatory so that would ha- that would probably not even solve the problem for uh, problem perfectly but and that would also have all kinds of uh, really nasty side effects um, and then there's also this possibility of a more kind of crypto native technical solution right that would actually allow people to cryptographically prove that they're being in this case, for a yeah, like very specific and uh, mathematically yeah, definable definition of honest, right? Which is basically that they actually hold their wallets coins that correspond to the yeah, balances that people have, and that um, you know the balances that, be, that people have actually are po- like positive numbers or zero, and the ends they're not negative numbers. And so, if you can cryptographically prove that those conditions are true, then like it. Ex- has that constraint onto it, would not even be able to uh, give Alameda this uh, credit line that FTX did without it being immediately noticed by any, by everyone as soon as uh, Alameda actually draws more money from it than they're theoretically supposed to. Um, so basically, post trying to figure out like what are some of the uh, easiest and um, most practical ways to actually accomplish uh, accomplish something like this and field that's uh, had a long history actually it started all the way back in uh, 2011 to 2013 uh, but it's been it propelled a lot the first time after the Mount Gox collapse right because uh, Mount Gox ended up uh, being insolvent uh, and uh, ended up not having the funds that it needed to cover deposits for uh, a pretty uh, significant amount of time before it collapsed and but then the the topic kind of uh, went away for a while as the uh, number of like these really big and catastrophic ex- exchange failures receded, and then it's obviously come back to the fore with the uh, FT- FTX issue. Thanks, Talek. Yeah, so I think for this discussion, uh, Talek said I think we'll be talking about some of the technological solutions that have come back into into the conversation rather than than focus on some of the regulatory solutions, which I know are in the news right now. So for those, for those technical solutions, Nick, you've been um, uh, an enthusiast of proof of reserves and proof of solvency for a while. Do you want to talk a little about some of the traditional approaches, including how they, how they involve auditors in the process? Sure, yeah. Um, so there's actually a total array of uh, approaches to the problem. Um, and even within the last month, I see a lot of heterogeneity and the different um, approaches to proof of reserve. I mean, even the nomenclature is challenging. I think I might try and rebrand it, proof of reserve and liabilities, PRL or something like that. So, you know, the basics is, you know, cryptographically attesting to assets held, um, which is tends to be pretty trivial. And then the harder part is, uh, you know, disclosing aggregate liabilities owed to, you know, users of the platform or clients and the orthodox way to do that, um, well, there's different approaches, I suppose. Like BitMEX, for instance, they really le- they released their whole list of liabilities, and then other exchanges um, do a Merkleized approach such that their users can verify that they're included in the liability set. Uh, with the idea being that if the exchange was selectively excluding liabilities, then users would be able to flag that, um, and then. One distinction among some of these approaches, um, and you know, we've seen proofs of reserve from Kraken, Bitmax, OKCoin, OK Gate.io, 
Bybit, Binance. So there have been a number of these recently. And uh, one distinction is some include auditor oversight to ensure that the basically the liability extraction is sort of faithful uh, because there's certainly possibility to game the process, uh, understate or omit liabilities. And then in other cases, there's no auditor oversight. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm seeing heterogeneity there. There's also some exchanges are not doing all the assets that they list. They're not covering all the assets. Um, and then there's also distinctions in sort of uh, frequency. So I think uh, BitMEX now actually does theirs on a bi-weekly basis, and then others are doing it kind of a, every six months or so, um, which I think is important because a point in time proof of reserve doesn't prove all that much because, of course, you could engage in window dressing and borrow funds on short notice to, to recover the liabilities. Um, so I haven't actually seen a convergence towards a singular model. Um, instead, uh, there's sort of a cluster of different approaches uh, and, and different levels of assurance, I think. Um, and especially with Binance's recent proof of reserve um, the, the procedure has really kind of become really controversial now. So I think what I'd like to see would be sort of more confluence over sort of like a, a single approach to the problem. And, it, you know, it's not clear to me whether auditor oversight is necessary. I know there's probably f opinions differ on that. Uh, that's an interesting thing that some of them include auditors and, and some don't. Yeah. So, so in practice, Je Jesse and Hong, would you like to um, describe a little about what you would uh, each of your, exchanges has done to um, to try to address people's concerns about proof of reserves and solvency? Sure, happy to. Uh, the uh, proof of reserve program acts at a couple of things that we are really focused on, but the, uh, the principle is that we want to really rely on uh, to, to ensure more transparency and more integrity of the proof of reserve protocol that we run that can be verified individually by our customers. For example, to give the transparency uh, to our customer, we published uh, 23 BTC addresses and 13 ERC-20 addresses that we use. Um, we published a uh, self-audit feature for our customers so that they can actually verify their own assets and liabilities uh, on our form. Uh, we also open sourced our uh, POR uh, protocol for everyone to check in GitHub, uh, I'll uh, share later on my uh, Twitter so everyone can actually take a look. Basically, everyone with that interest and technicality can, really can go and actually run the whole thing. So the uh, the integrity of uh, our proof of reserve call. Arguably, I think we are the only exchange that to enable on chain verification of address ownership uh, because uh, we basically um, use uh, the private key of those published addresses to sign the message of an you know, I'm an OKX address and provide that results in the uh, downloadable file for users to vary. Either use your own tool to uh, or uh, either um, There are also a couple of other things that we actually um, did in our proof of reserve protocol to make sure that it's, uh, it shows integrity that people can uh, and um, have more trust and feel more comfortable. Um, for example, I took a look at uh, the missing uh, um, audit report for Binance uh, Perfect Reserve uh, uh, Program, and there are a couple of uh, flagged there. Um, actually, for example, uh, we we didn't truncate the Merkle leaves and. The named by IS, even if we want to, uh, we have to ensure uh, one unique ID for every customer, uh, computed by using uh, a customer's ID on an OKI platform, or that um, uh, the audit, uh, in the future, if we end up uh, picking an auditor and the customer will see one uh, same, um, uh, same, uh, when, when Two customers share the same balances, you know, potentially uh, one instead of two accounts. We use uh, summation, a Merkle approach instead of a plain 
poultry approach so that every communication um, has generation input actually pick up the user balance user count. So theoretically, if we actually have uh, 100% of our customers go out there and uh, do verification of audit and confirm that what they see is what they have, theoretically, these all and confirm that uh, proof of exercise we did our uh, act. Uh, there are, uh, these are the things that we actually do to ensure it's, you know, it's a really cool uh, solution. I'm sorry. I think you might be cutting out a little bit. I'm not sure if there's anything you can do about it on your end. Um, but the audio is cutting a little bit in and out. But I think we got most of the gist of it. Um, Jesse, uh, same question to you. How, how does how does Kraken's proof of reserves work? Yeah, so basically this is the process that was, uh, I think, originally conceived by um, Greg Maxwell and, and described by Zach Wilcox. Um, we did this basically following the Mount Gox collapse in 2014. Um, obviously, it's a way to, to prove that that we were also not insolvent, and um, you know it's it's an imperfect process, you know, like Vitalik mentioned, and that just it's a point in time snapshot. But um, in every one of these massive blow up blow ups, um, had we had just a point in time snapshot, you know, even every six months, um, we would have prevented these blowups from being as huge as they are. You know, usually, and in the case of Mt. Gox, the hole was just getting bigger over the course of years, you know, so if we'd been able to spot that a hole was emerging, um, you know, six months into it, you know, it may have only been 20% of the size that, that it ultimately ended up being, and it's probably the same case for FTX as well, that, that they were probably insolvent for quite a while. So, um, you know, it's sort of, it's not perfect, um, but you know if you continue to do these over time, and obviously more more frequently, is better. Uh, and if you can do them on on an unpredictable schedule, uh, that's even better because you know there's just less opportunity to to game it. But um, if you can do it more frequently, there's just less uh, less chance for you to um, be able to game it without being noticed. You know, so obviously people would would recognize if you're moving a lot of funds around um, right before or after the audit. Um, so, you know, that, that was pretty much the impetus for it was to to show that, you know, obviously a lot of trust had been lost in Mt. Gox uh, in, in crypto and centralized venues after that uh, explosion. Um, so the point of it was, was basically, um, well, the process was, uh, so for the first one in 2014, we had an auditor, Stephen Thomas, who was the CTO of Ripple and uh, OG Bitcoiner. Um, very hard to find an auditor to do this, uh, which is why we didn't do it again for, for several years. But, um, you know, basically the process was to, to sum up the client balances um, and to uh, prove that we controlled all of the, the coins and uh, you compare those two numbers, you know, the auditor can, can review and ensure that they're not negative balances included in uh, the Merkle tree of, of client balances um, and, uh, you know, show that we actually control the wallets uh, with, with the coins one for one. Uh, not, you know, I think it's important to, to draw the distinction between what some other uh, exchanges have put out recently, which is uh, a sort of statement of collateral value, you know, so which is exactly like how FTX blew up, right? Like they claim to have this collateral. They were they were borrowing customer Bitcoin and customer dollars against FTT and maybe a basket of other shit coins that were actually super liquid and not really worth anything. So, um, you know, I think something distinct about the, the proof of the, the real legit original proof of reserves was that it was like, you just count the coins. It's like, how many Bitcoin do you owe? How many Bitcoin do you have? And um, you also have to prove that you control the address. So it's not just like, here's a list of wallets, you know, which, which has also been something other exchanges have done recently. It's just, just published a list of wallets with no proof that they actually control the wallets. Uh, you know, and so that's nice, but like also you could lose control of those wallets at any time, right? Like, I mean, in the case of Mt. Gox, Mark had the keys, but the hackers also had the keys. Um, and the hackers 
uh, had the keys, you know, were, were draining this wallet for a long time. So that that kind of solves that problem, right? Where like everyone can kind of observe this wallet and like, why would this cold wallet continually be be drained? Mark just wasn't paying attention to that. But um, you know, having the list out there doesn't necessarily show that you still actually have control, and and you could just provide a list of someone else's wallets too. So um, part of the process is, is to prove that you actually have control of those wallets, and that's done by signing messages uh, from the wallets, you know, to, to show that basically you control the private keys. Um, so that was the original process. Um, you know, I think I think the the proof of reserves name is is a bit unfortunate in that, uh, you know, I think it if you're not familiar with the process and, and what that actually means, you know, the, the original spec for this that, um, you know, some recently have have attempted to sort of uh, redefine what that means, you know, by by simply saying that, well, proof of reserves means uh, we provide a list of wallets or proof of reserves means um, we we show that we have collateral e equal to whatever, you know, Bitcoin that we owe. Um, and that's not what it originally meant. And, you know, I, I think attempts to do that are uh, are big red flags to me. I don't know why you would attempt to, um, you know, rename something when you could just do the, the original thing or, or call your new thing something different uh, unless you were trying to hide something. Um, but so so that's what we've done. You know, and I think I think the main core core pieces of it and, you know, maybe to next point, maybe we need a new name for this because the old name is actually like too easy to, to confuse people with. But um, it's it's the Merkle tree of of the client balances. Uh, it's, it's some assurance that they don't include negative balances, you know, and that can come from an auditor or it can come from like ZK proofs or, you know, maybe there's some other, you know, cryptographic method of, of showing that the Merkle tree doesn't contain negative balances. Uh, you can also just publish all of the uh, the whole tree with all the balances um, as one option, but yeah, there may be privacy issues with that, you know, which I think the, the ZK method um, resolves. Uh, and then you need to, to prove that you actually control the coins uh, and not, not like in terms of collateral, but like one for one, you have a Bitcoin for every Bitcoin that you owe. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's pretty much the process. Um, and we're going to try to accelerate the pace of doing that. I think if we can do something uh, if we can upgrade to to the zk method, you know, we could maybe do it even even more frequently, maybe as frequently as Bitmax, or or we um, maybe we downgrade the privacy a little bit, or maybe there's some other way, you know, that we can do it uh, just without the auditor would allow us to do do it more frequently. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks to both of you for coming on. Uh, sorry, Hong. Yeah, I would see that on what just said. I think um, there is a screen um, where. Like, and, and privacy, right? Because when we try to increase transparency of our, our program, we have to publish uh, the, uh, the addresses, um, BTC, a, a combination of uh, a cold wallet and a hot wallet, but primarily cold wallet, and, and continue to use those addresses in the future so that people can actually continue to monitor flows. Uh, our intention is to do our... Um, POR uh, on a monthly basis. So the next one coming second of this month. But there is a, a trade off there. Um, and separately, we are also looking at the um, uh, ZR uh, SNARK technology to, to can uh, uh, use that to, uh, to, to offer more assurance with more privacy. Thanks, Hong. Because there are concerns about, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's a great segue into. Um asking Ellie about StarkX. So Ellie, do you want to explain a little about how StarkX works um, and generally how, how non-custodial exchange could potentially solve some of these problems? Yeah, so um, so basically the premise behind StarkX is that um, preventing is always better than detecting. Or if we're on the topic of uh, safe sex, then uh, using contraceptives is far more uh, is far better than having or doing a pregnancy test. Um, and the analogy here is that um, basically a proof of reserve can detect something that happened after it happened, uh, whereas self-custody um, prevents misappropriation in the first place. 
And um, that's actually what happens on StarkX. So, you know, for the customers that are using it, uh, folks like uh, Rhino, DYDX, uh, Canvas, Immutable, Sorare, and others, um, it is um, basically impossible for them or for, for us or for anyone to misappropriate funds, and you cannot put them as collateral. So, for instance, uh, just to give a very concrete example, uh, DYDX um, has uh, on the L1 smart contract around uh, 420 million dollars. Now, that, you know, as we're speaking, uh, if tomorrow uh, someone in DYDX or Starker would have wanted to put those 420 million dollars as collateral or send them somewhere, this would be cryptographically prevented, not just reported. Um, you would need the signatures of the users. Now, there is a very interesting way in which you could use uh, StarkX um, to actually achieve proof of reserves today. Uh, I learned this from our head of uh, research, uh, Avihu, who is also listening here. Um, and uh, you could basically allow exchanges to use StarkX to report um, their, uh, basically their liabilities and uh, their assets, uh, even for things that are non-Ethereum uh, based because StarkX today is deployed only on Ethereum. So they could put their fiat uh, um, amounts there. They could put their uh, Bitcoin and other uh, L1 liabilities and assets there and basically have a constant uh, proof of uh, reserve uh, that would be generated basically as, you know, as immediately as they need it. Um, this this could work. Uh, I mean, this actually works today out of the box. It is uh, the way we view it uh, at Starkware. It's a little bit like using a, a, a solar panel only for shade. So you could use a system like StarkX, which offers you um, self custody and no misappropriation of funds. You could use it only to report on liabilities and and uh, reserves. That's fine. But you could do, of course, much more. And uh, yeah, I mean. It is our hope that uh, that becomes actually the industry standard at some point. Yeah, so I think StarkX is that is one solution for um, uh, for non custodial exchange, and of course there are others um, like on chain on chain decentralized exchanges. Um, but you can use you can also use Starks or Snarks to as a tool to help with with proof of reserves, as Jesse as Jesse mentioned. Um, and I think uh, Vitalik, you talked a little about some of the ways that uh, in your in your post about that zk that zk proofs and other kinds of custom cryptography could be used um, to enhance what proof of reserves and liabilities currently offer. Um, do you want to elaborate a bit on that, Vitalik? Uh, sh sure. Uh, so I think the uh, technological history of uh, proof of reserve protocols kind of mirrors the technological history of things like. It's like a pre-general purpose uh, snark age and a post-general purpose snark age. In the pre-general pre purpose snark age, like for example, in its scaling space, there has there there were you know things like plasma, uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, scaling protocols that use fraud proofs, various kind of Merkle tree and Merkle hashing stuff, and in the uh, centralized exchange space, we saw things like. Like basically the Merkle sum tree protocol, right? And the best that you can do with that technology. Uh, but, like, I think... I think you're cutting up a bit for me. I'm not sure about for others. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah same. same. So, hello, hello. Sure one, two, three. Have, uh... um, one, two, one, two yeah, three. You... Yeah, okay. Um, do you have another network or something you can switch to? Oh, you cutting out. A, you, you cut out a lot there. I'll, I'll try. Okay. I'll, um. So just to kind of uh, recap again, what I uh, what I was saying, right? Basically, that there are these uh, 
kind of older Merkle tree based approaches and uh, in the scale in the blockchain scaling space plasma is a big one and in the uh, exchange uh, proof of solvency Still breaking, I think. Yeah, sorry, Vitalik, you've dropped off entirely now. All right. Ah, I, can, I think I can explain a bit what I think was uh, what Vitalik wanted to, to say, um, that there are also fraud proofs and... Um, Variants of them, both optimism and uh, plasma, which use fraud proofs also for achieving things like self custody, and um, which means basically, you, you know, you, if, if user discretion is needed to do anything and no misappropriation can happen. Um, and then I think Vitalik also wanted to discuss a little bit the distinction between um, sort of um, customized crypto solutions that are, you know, one-off for a solution and then more generic things. Oh, okay. It's based on the Merkle tree. Symmetry approach. And the yeah. Sorry, Vitalik, I don't think we, we can't make out any of that. Uh, if, you could, if you're able to switch to another network, maybe that'll help. Sorry, not, not able to hear any of it. Topic is based. Yeah, uh, likewise. I mean, concretely, I suggest uh, maybe Dan, let's uh, try maybe a little bit later because. Uh... Sure. Um, yeah, well, I guess. I guess um... Uh, thinking back on what Ellie and, and Vitalik said, there are a lot of ways to not only ensure proof of reserves cryptographically, but also to prevent confiscation or theft um, uh, in the moment and, and keeping the custody of assets, the control of assets with the, with the users. And those are generally under the uh, category of non-custodial exchanges or decentralized exchanges. I'm curious to, to Jesse and Hong, I guess, like why, why do we need, need centralized exchanges at all? If we have, or, or do you think in the long run, uh, will we just be using non-custodial or decentralized exchange? That's a great question. I actually believe that a lot of the decentralized exchanges. At this point, we're still in decentralized exchanges, I think primarily for on-ramp, um, global. Uh, um, and, and that's why we actually continue to build it. Uh, and, and we also offer, our uh, decentralized custodial example. If you're in US right now, you open a OKX app, you can access our web wallet, which is a non custodial wallet that supports over 40 blockchains and have built in access to an all chain DEX. Uh, means that there's still a need for sex, we'll need to control and, and make it as transparent and safe as possible. Yeah, I agree with Hong. Hopefully, long term, we go completely to DEXs. But you know, for now, uh, the, the centralized exchanges exist as a as a good on ramp for the majority of the world. You know, that's still not into crypto that, that needs some sort of bridge from the fiat system. And uh, you know, it, where we don't have cross chain swaps available, so you know, there are new networks emerging mm -hmm. all the time, and there aren't yet tools to you know, swap from Bitcoin to some other <clears throat> new coin. Don't know why you'd want to do that, but, you know, so that, that exists um, as a, something that the centralized exchanges offer. And, um, you know, I think we'll see more things become tokenized in the world, but, uh, you know, for now we're still in a place where 
there's just not a ton of tokenization. And so centralized exchanges can help swap between assets that are not yet tokenized, um, you know, broadly like uh, fiat currencies. Um, and, you know, although that's that's getting better uh, to, to crypto. So uh, still there's still a place for centralized exchanges. Um, but, yeah, hopefully we get to, to DEXs in the future. I want to say, even though uh, I'm very much in favor of DEX, I think uh, sex is great and uh, there's a lot of room for it um, in the world of um, crypto. Um, as Jesse and Hong mentioned, things like holding custody for customers, it's often very, very convenient. There are assets that are not on, uh, um, that cannot be easily tokenized. And also there are things like, you know, uh, managing of order books and uh, customer acquisition and uh, having like these, uh, you know, darker pools of liquidity that are really, really important for more efficiency. They, they are probably going to remain. Uh, we may be seeing a separation of custody and exchange a little bit more like in uh, TradFi. And that's, of course, uh, uh, a good direction. But uh, yeah, uh, sex is here to stay. Um, similar question to Nick. Nick, how, how do you think all this shakes out in the long run? Yeah, I mean, um, I think we'll always have centralized exchanges, to be honest with you. They offer a convenience um, that a lot of users want, for better or for worse. Um, I mean, if you look at the share of assets on centralized exchanges, it's been dropping the last six months, but generally the long-term trend is up. And so I th I, I'm obviously pro you know, transactions generally moving to DEXs long term. Of course, DEXs themselves don't need a proof of reserve. Uh, they're just sort of inherently reserved. But I do think it will be an unavoidable permanent feature of the crypto space that we have these centralized exchanges. Um, we've clearly been largely remiss in actually governing them, um, even though, you know, the latest developments are encouraging. Um, I think... I am excited by the fact that a lot of exchanges are volunteering these proofs of reserves spontaneously, um, but they're of varying quality, right? The, like, I don't want to cast aspersions, but um, you know, some of the more recent ones are a little troubling. Um, so standardization, perhaps. I also think a lot of the reticence to do it has to do with privacy leaks, right? Um, publishing the liability set does leak a lot of information about the exchange, you know, the distribution of user balances, even though um, BitMEX had an interesting innovation there where they actually split user accounts randomly. Um, and then so e each user has two accounts in the liability set. So you can't really ascribe a balance to a user over time. There's still undeniably a privacy leak. And so some of the exchanges are still reticent to do it. Uh, I, th I know that there are legislative developments underway. I know this is more of a technical space than a policy one, but it's clear to me now that there will be requests from regulators to incorporate a proof of reserve into, um, you know, as a routine part of your oversight or administration of a centralized exchange. So it will become something that is asked of exchanges, especially onshore ones. And then the question is, how do we, you know, modernize the procedure. Honestly, I don't think the Merkel approach will be the standard way moving forward. I do think it will require uh, some sort of ZK proof um, attesting the liabilities because the Merkelized approach fundamentally leaks data. Uh, I, I don't actually, like, I see a fundamental tension there. Um, so that, that's why I was excited to read Vitalik's post, and I hope that we can actually achieve some sort of standard there. It's interesting that the provisions paper has been out, I think, for seven years now, but we've never actually seen an implementation of this um, deployed by an exchange um, for ZK proof of liabilities. Uh, and so I do think that will actually be essential here as proof reserve becomes more normalized, becomes something that regulators ask of exchanges, um, and to get exchanges comfortable with doing it without sort of, you know, leaking too much data. I do think we're going to need to move to the CK model. Um, so, you know, really hopeful that we see more developments there. I think that's a very important sort of research topic. I know that Coinbase actually proposed a grant for that precisely. They kind of, you know, demurred a bit on doing a proof of reserve, but they also said that they're proposing a research grant for that. So I'm hoping we see uptake there as well. Great. Um, thanks, Nick. And, um, 
Sorry, Jesse, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say there, there's still the problem of <clears throat> needing to pull out your private keys and, and sign these messages, right? Like, I mean, even if you could, even if you could do this without an auditor, um, you still got to get your private keys out and sign something. And so that still, I think, will, will continue to be something that slows the process down. Um, you know, you, you don't want to do that every day. Uh, so, you know, I think that'll, that'll be something we have to work on. Um, I don't know if there's any, any solution to that, you know, but, um, you know, I, I guess that's sort of, sort of an outside, you know, probably, probably not the most common case of an exchange um, getting hacked, but, you know, there's still the chance that uh, the wallets are there, but you've, you've lost control of them, you know? So um, that's, that's probably not something you, you do need to prove as often as that, like the coins are actually there or not, you know, if, if people can watch the coins um, and see that they haven't moved, then maybe you don't need to like actually sign uh, so frequently, but that's something that potentially could, you know, an imperfection that could slow the process down is actually having to, to get your private keys out. And you don't want to do it on a predictable basis where, you know, now you create like a, a security problem because hackers know when you're going to be um, accessing your private keys, you know, and they can time an attack against you. I mean, this again leads to self-custody, right? With self-custody, you actually don't have to uh, expose your keys because uh, basically they're... Uh, uh, they're the customers. So, uh... yeah. Um, cool. Th thanks, Jesse and Ellie. We actually just had um, Johnny from, from BitMEX Research um, join, and he can talk a little about the proof of reserve solutions that they've done. I'd also encourage, we have about 10 minutes left. If anyone in the audience has any questions for this panel, um, please re request to speak, and we'll try to get to a couple of people before we, uh, before we wrap up. But, Johnny, uh, take it away. Oh, hi. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I think the first thing to say is when we were developing uh, our proof of reserve solution, the first exchange we looked at was CoinFloor, which is a UK exchange. I think it's now gracefully shut down. Uh, and they had a very, very interesting proof of reserve scheme, uh, which went on for a number of years and it happened every month, I think. Um, so basically they just took um, every customer account, uh, like email address, plus the block height, plus a random nonce and hash that. And then they took the account balance and they every single month they published that full list of all the account balances with their hashed username for anonymity. Um, and then, so that's kind of the proof of liabilities. And for the proof of reserve side, every single month what the exchange did was they actually spent on chain a Bitcoin transaction output with a hash of all those liabilities, um, I think as an op return. And they just spent an amount of Bitcoin in one transaction greater than all their liabilities. So that was a very, very strong system in terms of prove, proving the solvency of CoinFloor for a number of years. Um, however, it didn't really respect customer privacy at all because you could see the entire distribution of all the balances, uh, like Nick was saying. And of course, some customers had the same balance month on month. So you could see... Um, you could follow an account's balance over time. And we actually did that analysis and found information about CoinFloor customers that um, maybe they weren't happy revealing to the public. So for an organization like BitMEX, Bitfinex, OKCoin, uh, Binance, and FTX, the, the customers would probably be very, very unhappy if that level of information was disclosed. And we just realized at BitMEX there was no way we could do that. It would really violate customer privacy the counterparties to the trades could work out people's positions uh, and trade against them using the proof of liabilities. So uh, what we did was we split uh, customer balances. So we tried to adopt that kind of coin floor system, but randomly split them each time. And actually, each customer balance is split at least four times um, rather than two by random numbers. And therefore, it's computationally unfeasible, really, to get any... Uh, information about um, about the customers' balances over time because of these random splits, and if you just, I mean, I think Bitmax has about the, the total size of that list of liabilities is a million. So if you do like a million choose four, that's a very large number. Um, 
and it's almost impossible for any computer to do any kind of brute force attacks on that. So we are kind of convinced that the information we've published in our by splitting the accounts uh, is going to not reveal anything that customers would want to be kept private. Um, so that, that's kind of the one key aspect is splitting the balances, but also uh, like CoinFloor, every, well, BitMEX does it twice a week. We publish that entire Merkle tree of liabilities. And then that's all public. And to find your own balance, you, you search across that Merkle tree looking for a hash collision um, with the hash digest of a leaf and your uh, random nonce that we provide you. And whenever there's those collisions, you just sum up all those leaves and that should match your liability with the exchange. So, I mean, the solution BitMEX implemented and a lot of this work was done in kind of June 2021 was absolutely not a panicked response to the failure of FTX because there's no way we could have implemented this that quickly. There was work we did uh, a long time ago and then we only finally kind of rolled it out recently after the FTX failure. And yeah, I'm very happy to answer any questions anyone has on our scheme. And of course, one thing we want with this free reliability scheme is for other exchanges to copy if they think that this is the best solution available. Yeah, let me actually chime in there, Johnny. I want to put myself on record here. Because, um, I want to thank you and your team for two things. One is that an uh, OKX public appeal, I think your team is actually for to uh, actually check code and respond and provide feedback so thank you for doing that and secondly i think the second asset uh, i think is quite smart and our engineers actually take a look at that and see if we can replicate that as well to improve the privacy thanks thanks johnny and um, um yeah uh, uh vitalik i think we just got you back are you uh yeah yeah do i yes do i sound uh, less like a 20 percent connected robot now I think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anything you want to you say? You sound like a Vitali. Okay, yeah. perfect. <laughs> so only yeah. 20% robot. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, I guess uh, what was I... Uh, the thing that I started saying when my uh, internet broke, right, was just uh, trying to... Getting into some of the uh, kind of cryptography topics and basically the distinction between the earlier, like, very Merkle tree-based protocols where, and... Uh, there is this interesting parallel between like blockchain scaling and exchange proof of solvency, right? Which actually makes a lot of sense because they're trying to do very similar things, but uh, one is just uh, trying to detect and the other is trying to like explicitly make the thing that it's detecting be illegal at the smart contract level. Um, so there was the Merkle tree, Merkle sum tree based stuff. And then there was plasma um, and then there was uh, plasma cash and there were versions of plasma cash to rely on Mer on Merkle sum trees. And more recently, we have ZK Snarks and we have other kinds of uh, cryptography. And so one of the questions is like, basically, to what extent can we use like some of the really general purpose uh, stuff? So like either the te technology that Starkware is working on or Validium, te Validium technology or just like these very general purpose uh, ZK Snark frameworks to create you know, like very general and uh, customizable proofs of, uh, I guess, uh, res reserves and, li and liability that can be adapted to lots of different use cases. Hello? Hello, hello, I'm here. I'm um, actually uh, could I, uh, just like one quick question I wanted to ask: Has the uh, has the topic that uh, uh, been discussed that like I th the the goal that I for I forget who but some Starcore people uh, raised that like it's better to not detect but to prevent um, and like basically yeah. the, like has it been raised that that requires people to like basically that requires us to solve the self custody problem and uh, I think that's. Obviously, a problem that, that the Ethereum community really cares about, but like that, that is a problem that's just like it's not just a back end technology fix, right? Like, that's something that's going to require user education and a lot of work to get people to actually adopt safer solutions, right? Because right now, I think a lot of people do leave their money in exchanges precisely because they don't trust themselves to hold funds. So, I wonder, like, 
what people's thoughts are on that transition and how we can make that transition go better. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right that um, having the technology for self custody working out there is is uh, you know just one step. Uh, it, it does exist, which is good. Uh, that's exactly what Starkex gives. And then uh, I confess that also, you know, as an end user, of course, self custody is uh, has its uh, you know frightening aspect, um, but. Uh, those are being addressed in various ways. Uh, I'll give, um, I'll just mention a few. First of all, you can separate custody and exchange, meaning you can still choose, let's say, you know, if you really, really believe in Anchorage or in Fireblocks, you could decide that they should be um, the ones that custody your funds. And you could uh, still uh, self-custodially then uh, um, transact or at least separate the custody, which is with them from the exchange that could be uh, completely without any custody on it, right? And there are ways to do that uh, even over um, StarKicks today. So you could have solutions where uh, you have a separation of custody and exchange. In the current, um, uh, well, should I say sex scene or the, right, the uh, arena of uh, centralized exchanges, um, usually custody and exchange are one and the same. And that's part of the problem also that we saw at FTX. So at the very least, we could move to easily to a world where you have separation of custody and exchange. Um, and again, StarKix would uh, support that for you. Right, right. So I guess like might one of the theories be that just like the centralized exchange business uh, kind of selects for people who wants to do more fun and crazy stuff, but like really management of billions of dollars needs to be done by like, you know, quote unquote, boring people. And like separating the yeah. two would just increase safety just because of that. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Why, why we didn't go that route with Kraken? I mean, in part is because we got started in 2011, and you know, there just wasn't there, there wasn't a another dedicated custodian. You know, it probably wasn't even a viable business model uh, back then. So we had to build all this stuff. Uh, but you know, we we explored some options, including BitGo for a while, um, and uh, you know, basically, we determined that it was too hard. You know, we, we didn't want to have the business dependent on the custodian, you know, to determine what assets we would be able to list and, and when. And so that started to become a problem with BitGo. You know, we actually used BitGo for a while with, with our, our Bitcoin deposits, but um, they weren't able to do all the coins that we wanted on the schedule that we wanted. And so that led us to, to needing to have a separate system to be able to, to support custody and, and therefore, you know, trading of coins that, uh, that we wanted to on our own schedule and not be kind of held back or bottlenecked by by BitGo. So, you know, if a competitor releases support for, uh, you know, some other coin and we want to do it, you know, we don't want to then have to wait for, for the custodian to get around to supporting it in order to be competitive with another exchange. And so, um, so we had to maintain the separate system anyway. And then, it was sort of this problem of just like, all right, okay, well, it's, it's like just extra work to sort of maintain these two systems and it would just be easier to just have one system. And so we might as well just do it ourselves. And we see this custody sort of a, a core competency and, and something that we definitely don't want to be at the mercy of another company for, you know, I mean, imagine as an exchange, like losing your custodian somehow or, you know, having to switch custodians and one custodian doesn't support all the tokens that another custodian supports. Uh, so it's, it's actually like pretty complicated in practice. And, um, you know, I think if we were all using the same custodians and that therefore all had the same selection of assets that we could trade, that would obviously make it easier. But because we have this competitive environment, we're like, you know, right now the major exchanges can all list anything anytime they want because they all do their own custody for the most part. Um, you know, there's always that kind kind of constant arms race, and uh, I think the custodians need to like be able to keep up with that for them to really be a viable option for the, the large exchanges. Jesse would love to have a conversation about this because I think things have changed dramatically since 2011, and you can have the you know you can have your cake and uh, eat it as well. Uh, you can offer your customers self custody, sorry, custody with you, and you can also integrate uh, or allow them to choose any custodians they want and still operate in your exchange with safety. Um, you know, I don't mind doing a, 
biz dev talk on this forum, but maybe, uh, you know, would love to talk with your team about it. I think we have some very interesting things yep, along these idea. lines. Well, well, I think that's the hour. So um, really appreciate everyone coming on and thanks so much to Ellie and Starkware for, for hosting. Um, but uh, yeah, and I really appreciate uh, uh, Hog and Jesse sharing everything about um, uh, OKX, uh, OKX and OKCoin and, and Kraken, um, as well as Dick and Vitalik for all the work you've done to date. Thanks, guys. Thank you for hosting, too. Thank, yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.